Alright, my darlings. Well, with the month of me wanting to look at whatever the hell I want to look at now upon us, it's time for me to go really outside my comfort zone. Two years ago I had a look at an indie US movie, last year I had a look at a comic book TV series, but now it's time to look at something that I've never looked at on my channel before. Which is ironic considering what my channel's name is. Music. And what better way to do that than with a look at my all-time favourite band, ACDC. <laughs> You know that the new Animaniacs is coming out this month, right? No! We're doing ACDC today. Yes, ACDC, the kings of Bogan Rock and the premier group of Australia. Some may point to the Bee Gees, and while I do love them too, they haven't even come close to the level of adoration or cult fandom that the young boys have even now. Their music is unlike anything in rock and roll, and in almost 50 years of their careers, their music still sounds the same as it did during their heyday. And with their new album coming out today, it seems that it was time to take a look at a thing that can split ACDC fans right down the middle, much like the band logo. Who was the better singer of the band? Bon Scott or Brian Johnson? This is probably the biggest lead singer rivalry bout out of any band. Yes, bigger than Peter and Phil in Genesis. Bigger than Ozzy and Dio in Black Sabbath. Even bigger than Nemiha and Omelette of the Baha Men. Well, okay, maybe not that big. Though, ironically, the Baha Men's first name was actually High Voltage which probably doesn't help the confusion for ACDC fans when there are two albums called High Voltage, and the first one doesn't even have the song High Voltage on it. But I digress. I know this seems like an odd choice of something to look at on my channel, but this isn't technically the first time I've looked at ACDC on my channel before. George here again from Headphones UK, and I'm going to show you something that you music fans are going to love. It's the program from ACDC's Black Eyes tour. Only this time I've got a much better camera, a script, and I don't sound like some kid with a speech impediment just talking about his band into a really crappy camera. But before we get into the big nitty gritty here, let's take a look at the history of the band. So of course, ACDC is an Australian rock band founded by the brothers Angus and the late Malcolm Young, both of whom were from Scotland originally. And they started out in 1973, but by 1977 they were on top of the world. And a lot of that came down to the singer they brought on. Bon Scott who, ironically, was also of Scottish descent, despite not having met the two before. Hell, his name is even an abbreviation of Bonnie Scotland, for crying out loud. It's like infinity rock and roll, you know? Big man lying on the ground With the hole in his body where his life back feet Oh, let me tell you about Brett Young. Oh, man. no, no, that's not. <laughs> he joined the band in 1974, and along with his sleazy Casanova charisma, paired with Angus's little boy and rocker boy persona, launched ACDC into not just the biggest band in Australia at the time, but one of the biggest bands of all time. Bringing a sound that was high energy, semi-poetic but trashy, exhilarating, funny, reminiscent of old blues music, and unnaturally catchy. And for the first seven albums, Bon remained a sturdy member before tragically dying in 1980. It was definitely a very tragic loss, but in rock you either die a legend or live long enough to see yourself become a has-been. Which I think Scott knew, because the lyrics to the song Carry Me Home are eerily prophetic of how he actually died. Are y'all getting up and leaving? You think I'm gonna drown? Seriously, it is really creepy how much this song parallels the events of his actual death. That'd be like finding out if Kurt Cobain did a cover of the song, Give Me a Bullet to Bite On. Oh come on, how could I not do that joke? Of course, the remaining members considered breaking up the band since they felt that without Bon there was no point of going on. But they were in the middle of making a new album and felt it was right to honour Scott by finishing it off. So hired Geordie Singer, which is both his identity and how the fact that the band he was in was literally called Geordie. Brian Johnson, who wowed the band with his incredible performance of Bond's classic Whole Lot of Rosie, and so finished Back in Black with Brian in the vocals, and quite an amazing thing happened. Back in Black ended up being ACDC's biggest selling album. In fact, it was the best selling album for a while before Thriller came along. And so with their passion for the band resurrected, the gang kept going and decided to keep Brian, and with his more down-to-earth, salt-of-the-ground northern personality matching the band perfectly, 
They went on to become one of the longest running rock bands of all time, with them still making records to this day. So with the history of the band now under our belt, we have to come down to the fact of who was the better frontman for the band. Bon or Brian? It's worth pointing out that there were two other singers of ACDC. There was their original singer Dave Evans, who by the band's own admission was shit. And during a brief time in their Rock or Bust tour in 2016, Guns N' Roses singer Axl Rose took over for Brian, who was suffering from hearing issues during this point. But he doesn't really count since he's never been on a studio album with ACDC, and to be honest, his style doesn't really fit. Guns N' Roses and ACDC do have some similarities, mostly in how both of them weren't allowed on iTunes until 2012, but their style is very different, with Roses being more glam and polished, and ACDC has always got a dirty, unpolished and gritty style to them. Regardless, we now have to ask the question of who was the better lead singer for the Power and Energy players, the Heartbreaker from the Outback, or the Bonnie Lad with the awesome cap? Well, let's find out, shall we? Firstly, we need to establish the different style that these two have. Bon was more of a glam style singer. His voice was much higher, and he tended to not have much vocal range when he was singing, often staying within the same octaves, and rarely singing more than a few of the same notes per song. which fitted his hillbilly loverboy style, and most of the variety in the early ACDC songs' compositions came from Angus's guitar. A prime example would be the song Night Prowler, which goes through several different keys, but Bond's voice doesn't really change through the song, besides becoming a little bit louder in some places. What made up for this was how emotive his singing was. When he was singing about feeling a certain mood, you really felt it. You can feel the anger in his voice in Problem Child. <laughs> You can feel his sorrow in Gone Shootin'. She was running in an overdrive, up into my overkill. And you almost feel as lovelorn as him in Love Song. Of course, Bon had a large hand in writing many of the songs of his era. Many of the band's most iconic songs were partly written by him, and his writing style really captured the feelings and themes that the songs were trying to project, whether they're being funny and big balls, big balls, and big balls. hardcore and highway to hell, to or sleazy and little lover. Seriously, Little Lover is probably the sleaziest love song I have ever heard. Although it does get a little bit awkward when it gets to this bit. You had my picture on your bedroom wall next to Gary Glitter. No wonder they don't play that song anymore. Bon was also unique as a rock star because he was one of the few who introduced a very unique instrument to a rock song. That being the bagpipes. <laughs> One of Bond's early hits was It's a Long Way to the Top if You Wanna Rock and Roll, which you'll be familiar with if you've watched School of Rock, and it sounds awesome. I love the sound of bagpipes. If they're played well, that is. If not, then they just become a bizarre form of oral torture. And despite being a little bit anachronistic for this song and style of music, it really works, and it shows the significance that his contribution with this instrument made, since Brian refuses to sing the song due to being at Bond's baby. Brian Johnson, on the other hand, while he's not as good of a songwriter or creative mind as Bon was, and he can't really play any instruments other than his own vocal chords, he more than makes up for it with his incredible singing. I was born with a stiff. Stiff up a lip. He's far more versatile and powerful than Bon ever was, as sacrilegious as it might be to say. His voice is far more powerful, and he has an insane amount of versatility. Seriously, I could not even begin to sing like him. I get a sore throat from doing a gravelly voice just for a few seconds. He can do it for months on end, and he doesn't even show signs of stopping. 
That's amazing. While those who aren't into rock music might find his voice grating, I think it's perfect for the band's songs, and it was a perfect fit to help bring ACDC into the 80s with bands like Motorhead coming out and having more unpolished and ugly sounding singers. And ACDC were always ones to embrace their more unpolished style, so it made sense that they get this son of a minor to be the next phase of their career. So that's the breakdown of their singing and how they affected the band overall, but which one is truly better? I personally feel that both are great, but they're both good for different reasons. Brian Johnson is by far the better singer. His voice has far more of an impact and even has more versatility, as in songs with Boogeyman, Stiff Upper Lip, and his cover of Whole Lot of Rosie. Yeah! There's even supposedly an unused demo of Back in Black with Bond doing the lyrics, and apparently it's nowhere near as good. Sadly, the real version's never been released, though that hasn't stopped people from trying to fake it. To quote one of the commenters of this video, even a deaf person could tell that's not the real Bon Scott. Brian is just one of those guys who feels like someone you'd want to hang out with. He seems like a very down-to-earth, friendly sort of bloke, and his singing, despite being so gruff, bizarrely reflects that. ACDC songs, meanings and themes became a lot more generic after Brian joined the group. So it left the listener having to interpret more what they felt the song was about. And with Brian, even with his voice from hell, he somehow still comes across as very cool and friendly. And from what I've heard, that is accurate. And that he is a very nice guy. The episodes of Top Gear he was on will prove that quite a bit. Thanks very much for this wonderful honour and for this fabulous trophy. <laughs> you must have spent a fortune on this. <laughs> My name's Brian, not Bryn. Nice and easy, like gravy. You must remember this. And it's nice to have that sort of amiability in a front man for a band, especially since the Beach Boys can vouch for what it's like having a total tosser as your lead singer. Which is ironic considering his last name is Love. I sang the same lyrics to both songs. I was so nervous, I sang the first song, and then I sang the second one with the same words, because I couldn't hear anything with the noise. However, I personally feel that the lyrics and writing of the band's songs were much better when Bon Scott was the singer. Most of the songs from his era were rather deep and complex, despite their raunchy subject matter and having rather silly titles, such as with songs like Hell Ain't A Bad Place To Be, Give Me A Bullet, and Touch Too Much. <laughs> Even the more basic songs were very good with details and putting you into the singer's perspective very effectively. After Brian took over, the songs became very generic and basic in relation to the genre that ACDC were in. And while that was where the rock industry was going at the time Brian came into the band, after all this is when glam rock was starting to become popular, some bands like Def Leppard and Iron Maiden post-Killers album, that is, prove that deeper lyrics can still work, like Death's Coming Under Fire or Maiden's Run to the Hills. The white man came across the sea He brought us pain while there was the occasional song that had deeper and interesting lyrics and compositions to them, like The Fuhrer, Rock and Roll Dream, and Who Made Who, they weren't quite as same as the almost poetic ways Scott would write his songs. I know that's an odd thing to say, considering he also wrote songs like The Jack, Big Balls, and Crabsley and Blue, but Bond's songs really paint a mental picture while you're listening to it. You can really follow the narrative of his songs whilst he's spinning his lyrics. I honestly have trouble thinking of any of the later ACDC songs done with Brian that capture that same sense of personification. Like I said, the subjects of the songs during the Brian era became much more generic, which is good for letting the listener lose themselves in the music, but it doesn't make it quite as memorable. There are some Johnson songs that do invoke a lot of images and scenarios when you listen to them, like Boogeyman, Night of the Long Knives, and Borrowed Time. <laughs> but they don't quite hold up to Bond's lyrics. Now, of course, there is Back in Black, but most of the songs of that album were written by Bon Scott before he died. And if I'm honest, I'm not really a big fan of that album. Just hear me out, please. Oh, for sure, it does have some great songs like Hell's Bells, Rock and Roll Ain't Noise Pollution, and What Do You Do For Money, Honey? But a lot of the songs on the album just don't quite do it for me. 
Even the title song I'm not that big a fan of, but that's just my preference, especially since I loved Highway to Hell so much and it's still my favourite ACDC album, but I digress. It's a shame though, because even the most hardcore ACDC fans can't deny that during the 80s, post Back and Black, a lot of ACDC's albums started to blend into each other. Even I sometimes have trouble discerning if some songs are from Flick of the Switch or Fly on the Wall. And I'm not saying they were bad, but they were starting to lose a bit of their original sting. They brought it back up in the 90s with albums like Razor's Edge and Stiff Upper Lip, which were awesome albums, and even into the new millennium with Black Ice or Rock or Bust, they have still brought us the rock that we want and has given us some awesome tunes. But even after that, ACDC's music hasn't really developed much since the 80s. Just for a point of comparison, here's what they were sounding like in 1988. <laughs> And here's what they were sounding like by 2008. And as I said before, part of the appeal of ACDC is how they've sounded the same after all these years. But even during the Bon Scott era, there was still a sense of evolution, even if it was minor. But when Brian came in, that fish with legs was pretty much stopped dead. Then again, I guess it's better for a band to not change at all than to go in a completely different direction and end up alienating your fan base. Right, Axel? This isn't to say that ACDC died after Bond did. Quite the opposite. Most of my favourite ACDC albums are from the 90s and 2000s era, but their 70s albums can't be forgotten either, and most of my favourite songs do come from the Bon Scott era. Carry Me Home is still my favourite song in their repertoire. And of course, there's Highway to Hell, Live Wire, TNT, It's a Long Way to the Top, Jailbreak and Soul Stripper. But then you've got songs like Are You Ready, Thunderstruck, Who Made Who, Dogs of War, Hail Caesar, and even the most recent Shot in the Dark. Brian has proven that he can make just as many hits as Bond can, and then some, even if he lacks Bond's poetic writing style and compositional variety. He makes up with it with his unholy singing talent and how he's been keeping the energy going for over 40 years. Something that I don't even think Bond could have done even if he did survive. Both are great as the main vocalist, I just feel it's down to which element of the band you prefer. The flow of the music, or the style of the song. Take your pick, really. But this does come down to the question that the video has in its title. Who is the better one, in my opinion? It's a really hard decision to make. But if I really have to choose, I think I'm gonna have to go with Bon. It's so hard having to choose between the two, and I do really love Brian a lot, but if I'm being honest to myself, I do find myself listening to Bon's songs more than Brian when going through my albums. It is something about his oddly scummy but still very captivating charm that I feel hasn't been topped yet in rock music, and the amount of great direction he had when he was the lead singer was amazing, and I would have liked to have seen where he could have taken the band if he hadn't died. But even with that said, it's hard to deny that if Brian hadn't taken over, ACDC might not have lasted much longer. Bond style may have been ahead of its time in 1976, but by 1980 it was starting to get a little bit outdated, and he didn't show many signs of changing his core style, despite how many tweaks he gave it over the years. But Brian helped by bringing the band into a new decade, and while having a few bumps along the way, he did bring them into the new millennium, and that cannot be understated. And it's undeniable that Brian is the better singer of the two, but I have to go with what my heart tells me, and that is Bon. But even with that, ACDC are a band that are as faithful and reliable as a Labrador next to a geyser in Yellowstone National Park. No matter what's happened in the world or with them, you can always guarantee that they'll give you that same awesome sound that you come to them for. And that's why Power Up is an album that I don't even have to think about buying. Hell, it's the first album I've ever pre-ordered in my life, and no matter what the outcome, I won't be disappointed. Because ACDC have the power and energy to keep going no matter what. Rock on, mates. But for now, I've had enough of this. I'm going on the other side to have a bath. Bye! I'm not